Welcome to the United States of America podcast, friends. Um, this morning, I want to introduce, oh, I messed up. I messed up because I'm so excited, Anna. And I thought we would just dive into this because I've been waiting. I think I was awake most of the night just thinking about this. And we have so many questions. We have so much excitement. There's a lot of confusion. And I want to really just jump on into this. Um, there's a lot of questions. We're going to continue some of the topics on the bank this week and clarify. There's a lot of folks out there that are a little bit confused. Some of you I'm going to encourage to re-watch the episode last week because a lot of your questions were answered in that episode. I think you have to listen to it three or four times because we kind of answered a lot of the things. But Anna, there's this big conversation going on about this is not Anna's bank. This is somebody else's bank. Um, <laughs> do you want to, would you like the mic? I don't know why or what axe to grind or why there's this big confusion being created. I it, think there's nothing confusing about it really, but, but there's a big confusion being deliberately created by some people who just can't get it through their heads that we're creating not just a bank, we are creating an entire bilateral banking system something that will be global in scope and every country will have one two three however many bilateral banks serving their population i mean it's a very simple concept and it's the way banking used to be done so i mean i'm i'm really beyond it in terms of why is this so difficult for people to grasp um we you can charter a bank on the land a government can charter a bank on the land or it can register a bank on the sea and all of these banks that you are most likely familiar with there are some some land jurisdiction banks out there but most of the banks that you're familiar with are registered on the sea they're maritime corporations they operate under the law of the sea okay and they're registered now what we did is we chartered a bank the global family um, banks there are two there's the global family international trade bank and there's the global family bank of commerce okay the trade bank owns the bank of commerce the bank of commerce is chartered on the land so it's an unusual kind of bank relative to what people are used to okay it doesn't mean that it's it's never been done before in a certain sense but it hasn't been done in many many years all right so we've got a different kind of commercial bank we chartered it it's not registered under the king it's not operating under the law of the sea it's operating under the law of the land all right so I trust that my words are pretty straightforward here. I'm not trying to obfuscate or keep anybody from uh, understanding this. I'm right out here in front of you all right now. See it, okay? Chartered banks, registered banks. Both are operating in commerce, one on the sea, one on the land. All right? So yeah, is chartered equivalent to recorded versus registered? Okay, friends, so we all are familiar with the fact that we don't register things on the land. We record them for living people. And so chartering is the way that you record a corporation in international jurisdiction. International jurisdiction. Right. Right. So the we gotta break it. we got it. We're going to break it all down into bits and bots, Anna, because I'll be the person who doesn't understand. And I'll ask you the little ding ding. And then you'll just say we'll just line it right back on up. Get it back on the track because we just need to get everybody back on the path. Okay. That's all. So, so that's what this means, friends. Chartered means that it's recorded and not registered. Register is what the corporate airy fairies do. We are not airy fairy. OK. All right. 
So anyway, when we got to looking at like a global picture of how many banks were chartered on the land and how many banks were chartered on the sea, uh, if you were to look at a globe and pretend that it was nighttime and, and all of them had their little light, their little point of light, and all of the the uh, banks that were maritime were showing up as little blue points all over the globe. And the, the land uh, jurisdiction banks were showing up as little red dots all over the globe. There were hardly any red dots left. Okay. Well, so anyway, um, we, we, we were looking at this in terms of us um, doing a banking system for land jurisdiction commerce that would put it back under land law and under national control. Mm. And so, so that's Matt, it. Um, so we have the centralized banking system. You're talking about the bilateral banking system. Are we to interpret that this is a system like that, a system, not one bank, but a system? Right. It's a system of banks, and and every every country will have their own bilateral bank, or more than one bilateral bank, and all these bilateral banks will be structured the same way. They'll have a international trade bank that deals in actual factual asset backed currencies, gold, silver, and all that, and they'll have a land based jurisdiction commercial bank that is owned by the trade bank. Okay. okay. It's so, a simple concept, but it allows you to do both. Meaning business and personal friends. So you can run your business in the commercial side. You can have your personal and there's, so we should look at it in two halves. First of all, she's got no. the bilateral banking system versus the centralized one. No, 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 no. no. Okay. You should be looking at this in terms of commercial uh, forms of money versus actual money. Oh, okay. You've got, you've got the international trade bank that is dealing with actual money, actual physical assets, gold, silver, uh, platinum, jewels, land, cash, uh, you know, all that stuff. And then you've got a commercial bank that's dealing with all the fiat currencies, with stocks, with bonds, with those sorts of assets. Okay. That's that's the difference between a commercial bank and an international trade bank is the what they deal in. Okay. But if you've got two that are together, if you've got an international trade bank that owns the commercial bank on the land, then they're both operating under land jurisdiction, right? And they're both able to um, bridge into the world of commerce. They can both reach the, the jurisdiction of the air. And so when they're operating in the jurisdiction of the air, they can trade all over the world, right? I just had a bright light. So you're saying that the blue dots and the red dots should coexist. They're not not to coexist. However, we should identify them clearly because internationally you have you're you're dealing with hard assets versus the commercial instruments like you were saying like the gold and the blah 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 the land and everything. Versus, okay, I just want to make sure cuz okay. No, the way the commercial banks that you now have, the maritime commercial banks are structured is that they have a clump of assets. Pardon me. Bless you. They have a clump of assets <laughs> that are real. Okay. Bless you. So they've got, you know, however many thousands of tons of gold and silver and whatnot that are assets. Out of that, they can. Bless you. They can, they can extend however many. Um, millions of, of equivalent dollars or rubles or whatever, um, whatever their, their currency is based on those assets. Bless you. 
what the maritime banks do is they just take their assets and they block them off as if they're not even there. Mm. And they just keep rolling the credit. <laughs> Making their paper worthless. Well, it's, it's not that it's worthless. It's that the assets don't belong to them. Mm. So they're, they're making. Bless you. <laughs> they're I'm making. Paper. Bless you, bless you, bless you. I, my, you know, just having a sneezing fit. They're making money. They're making credit off of somebody else's assets. Okay. Gotcha. That somebody else is you and me. And the truth is, is that whoever owns the assets also owns the credit coming off those assets. The banks are pretending that they own assets that aren't theirs. They're lying about this and, and they're keeping people that actually have the assets from accessing and spending their assets how they see fit. So that's the criminal basis of the maritime banking system is that they've basically um, seized upon their depositors' assets, blocked them, and then raised credit off of those assets. And they are not only making money off of it, they're not giving any of the credit back to the depositors. So you see, they've robbed their depositors in order to do this. Mm -hmm. And they've also um, collapsed any kind of way for us to to trade gold and silver because they're hoarding it all you see physically or otherwise physically they're they're hoarding it they have they have it all locked up and they're using it as the basis to to promote credit so they loan credit that isn't theirs because they don't own the assets mm -hmm. to the people who own the assets they're, they're essentially putting your assets at risk and then loaning you your own credit and making money off of it. So it's it's a, it's a very, it's a queer deal. It's a completely, um, it's a, a criminal system. And so we want to get outside of that criminal system, bring our assets back, recoup our assets, scissor kick these damn banks that have been holding on to our assets under false pretenses that they don't know who we are or, or where the assets came from. I guess the fairy godmother just came down and went, you know, mm. anyway, so we want to take our assets back, fund our own bank and make all of this right. So that people who actually own the assets have access to not only their assets, but their credit. And so that people can, you know, have the advantage of being able to, well, number one, make their own mistakes, right? But also have the freedom to direct how they're going to spend their assets. You know, here's, here's a good example of it. Over the course of your lifetime, you pay into Social Security, right? It's an amount, 7.5% of your lifetime earnings goes into Social Security. So, you know, that is your contribution. Then your employers, anyone who employs you, has to pay an, an equal amount. So 15% of your lifetime earnings over the course of your working life is seized upon by FICA. And it's set aside and it's invested and bonds are issued on that and those bonds are like savings bonds that mature every 10 years okay so by the time you're you know say if you start out as a typical person uh 16 years old by the time you retire at least six of those bonds have matured and the receipts for those bonds should go to you and you should then be able to decide what you're going to spend your money on. You should be able to decide, well, here's my husband. He should be able to decide if he wants to spend his money, his social security money on a, um, a, a trip down to the lower 48 
to get uh, medical care that isn't available in Alaska. And there should be no question about that. You know, it's his money. He earned it, fair and square, right? Instead, you've got this board of lawyers and doctors sitting there deciding what's going to happen to you and how much they can afford to uh, give to everybody, including those who didn't pay into the program. And they're restricting your ability to take care of yourself, basically. And yet they've fronted all these bonds in your name. It's crazy. And so they're using all this social security money, for example, on these, these aliens who are coming across our border. And what, you know, and they're restricting and, and limiting and, oh, we won't pay for your emergency uh, evacuation and we won't pay for your, uh, you know, your trip to the hospital in, a, in an ambulance. Oh, and we won't pay for, for this kind of therapy and we won't pay for your stay in the nursing home, uh, but we're going to just hand it out like candy to the, you know, whoever walks over the border. And this is because people are not aware of what's going on. They're not standing up. They're not claiming their own crap out of the slush pile. You know, this is, it, it's crazy what's going on here. And we've allowed these politicians to get away with this for so long that they think that they can just flaunt the law by, you know, waving some fairy dust over your head and saying, okay, you are now a corporation. They are literally impersonating us. You know, have you ever thought about that word impersonate and the word person? Back in the 1860s, the uh, federal government waved its hand and said, okay, the word person now means corporation. For federal government purposes, this word now means corporation. Mm -hmm. Okay. So all the federal employees are persons. Right. They, they so have a really good time just changing. You know, when you can't communicate with each other, then you can't uh, work together, which is what they don't want. They don't want us to work together. And they don't, they want us to be frustrated with each other. And so if we can't understand what the words are that are coming out of our mouths, we can't understand each other. We get frustrated and then we can't, you know, stand against them. That's really the big deal. So and when they say that, Nithi, look at this. When they say impersonate, they mean incorporate. Yeah. Impersonate, incorporate. Yeah. This is true. Right. Yeah. So, you know, they're just arbitrarily making us into persons so that right. they can denigrate us, so that they can steal from us, and so that they can pretend that we are under a different law and prosecute us under that different law for their, for, their, for their benefit. They cage us and then leech off of us. That's what they're doing. Basically. Right. So anyway, they did the same things with the banks. They took the honest banks that were functioning under land law and that were doing carriage accounting, and they set up these, these phony baloney um, maritime banks that lie through their teeth and pretend that the assets they have are their own. And then, um, you know, basically lend your own credit back to you at interest, which is crazy. Um, the new yeah. It's the yeah, new right. man. <laughs> it's yeah, been, well. They, it, so it, for, for our YouTube friends out there, um, Anna, these people out in YouTube land, carriage accounting is just where you have the, for every debit, you have a credit. Isn't you know, it true? You start out with, a, a you know, five bucks and you take off 25 cents and oh, now you have $4.75. It's just, a, you know, a straight transactional record. What they're doing ever since 1946 is double accrual. And basically what double accrual means is that you've got two, two income streams and one of them's off the books. You may have heard your parents and grandparents snicker and, and talk about keeping two sets of books. Well, that's what they're doing. They've got a dishonest bookkeeping system. Part of it's budgeted and part of it's non-budgeted. You, the public, never hear about all the non-budgeted money flowing into the coffers of these assholes. Pardon me. I'm just I'm mad today. I'm just absolutely 
fed up. Just a bunch of crooks that I deal with every day. It's building they, up. It's they have no up. shame. They have no shame. And, no. and they've been doing this for so long that they think they have a right to get away with it. Uh -uh. And, you know, it's offensive. You know, if you want to be offended at my language, well, then you should be even more offended at what they've done. What, what they've done to you, to your family, and to your country. Right. It's outrageous. And they've gotten away with it since the 1920s. So back to our banking system. Banking system, yes. You're, you're creating a, a bilateral banking system. You are 100% participating in this with the other people, right, Anna? I thought of it. <laughs> okay. I just want it to be on the record. This was Anna's idea. Can we just like all, okay, so here's the situation. There's, there's a lot of talk going on that you, this isn't your project. This isn't your thing. It's somebody else's. I don't know who the other person is, but like it's somebody else's. All right. And so also I think it's interesting, Anna. So as we're, we, we operate on the record, we're recording this. We record all of our meetings. We record all of our conversations. We are, and, and we do that because this is, Anna, are we, are we pretending like, are we playing, you know, me and Cynthia were talking the other day and we were like, we think that there's people here that believe that we're pretending that we're running our own government. We're just pretending like, you know, you know, how children, Anna play with their dolls and their carriages and they go through and they pretend like they're shopping at the grocery store and they buy the plastic food and they run it through the little plastic cash register. It feels like we have people on our assemblies across the nation here that well, think that we're playing this game and it's and as evidenced by California, right? Like what happened? They tried to stand up. You told them that they had to declare who they are and like actually publish it and everybody quit. No, they didn't. Well, you know, right. you know, and, and bad on them, you know, bad on them. They wasted everybody's time. You know, the people of California acted in good faith. They held their elections. They elected them to office and then they pooped out. You know, shame on them. Shame on them forever. That, that was just a scandalously stupid thing that happened. And, but Anna, know, it, it revealed, you know what that experience did? That demonstration, when it happened, made it real for everybody else, all of us. When we all started talking about it everywhere else, then do you know what, Anna? A whole bunch of people quit because they were like, whoa, wait a minute. We got to we gotta tell people our phone numbers and our email address. Well, let me tell you, it cleaned out a whole bunch of people. I just want you to know because you you know, you're up there doing this big work and we're the ones helping you keep a pulse on the ground, right? So I'm people telling you. People are cowardly. They're never going anywhere. Say that again. You know, did I get people who are cowardly are never going to get anywhere. If you want to go hide under a rock, go hide under a rock. Leave me alone. I don't want anything to do with you. I don't want to know you. You're not worthy of being called an American as far as I'm concerned. You know, our, our ancestors didn't get anywhere by hiding under a rock. Okay. They might have thrown a few rocks, but they didn't hide under any. And so, you know, as far as I'm concerned, uh, you know, if you want to be a coward, you want to hide under a rock, you want all the benefits, but you don't want to have any responsibility. You know what? With every responsibility goes a right. And if you don't live up to the responsibility, you don't have the right. And nobody else has to earn that right for you. Are That's you sure, Anna, that you don't have a 528 frequency that would forgive these people? Uh, look, this is what's being said. If people are stupid and and gossip viciously and uh, do ugly things, you think there should be no consequence? You think that the love of Christ is, is some mamby pamby love? Do you think he went to the cross for that? No, I'm sorry. Do you, do you think that uh, that Gautama Buddha was was stupid or that he was was gutless. He left behind all of the power and pal for the of the palace and gave that life up. You think that he didn't have courage? 
you, you know, you think that there are not consequences in life? These people went all over creation and, and bad mouthed the bank and told lies. And then they acted irresponsibly and wouldn't take responsibility for their own actions. And now they want to walk back through the door and be welcomed with open arms. And they say, oh, well, you know, you don't have any right not to serve me. And they come back and they call people names and they gripe and they complain at volunteers who are, who are making this possible for everybody. Well, I'm sorry, you're going to get kicked to the back of the line. And I'm going to stand there and approve you being kicked to the back of the line. You know, it doesn't mean that you won't ultimately get your inheritance. It doesn't mean you won't be able to have an account. But I'll tell you this much. When you hurt people, you hurt volunteers who are, are there helping in good faith. And, and you come in like you're the lord of the manor and you start, uh, you know, boot kicking people and, and telling them all your rights and you're this and you're that when you haven't done a damn thing to develop any of this. You haven't spent even an hour developing a bank or thinking about a bank, but you want all of the benefits of a bank that other people have worked hard to create and that they're willing to share with you. They're willing to share the benefit with you of their work, okay, and their investment. And you come in and you act like an absolute idiot. Incompetent. These people are incompetent, Anna. That's the thing that they don't like. They don't like it when we say this, okay? But incompetence is a very simple word for people to comprehend. Well, and ingratitude. ingratitude. You know, it, the thing that really grates me is the ingratitude. I mean, here are these people who have been working since 2007 as volunteers, putting their own money in the pot to make it, to make it develop, you know? bringing this whole thing forward so that we have a banking system that is honest, that we do control that, right. you know, and, and then they just want to walk in and make all these judgments off the fly. And they want to tell us what we need to do and how we need to do it. And, you know, you would actually think that they were paying us to, to work for them. And they, they're very insulting. They call the, you know, they call up global and yeah, I want my account right now. And why is it my account on the, you know, and you know, rah, 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 rah. and these are people that are there as volunteers to help you. Right. They're not dead corporations. No. And we don't, we don't need it. You know, yeah. people who are going to be rude, people who are going to be judgmental, people who are going to flap their jaws and say all sorts of bad things about the bank. We don't need them. We don't want them. I'm sorry. These are, the, these are the people, Anna, that when they were in physical lines to get something that someone's giving them freely would kill people in front of them and trample them to get to the front of the line. That's pigs. it. They're pigs. I'm sorry. I don't need to deal with them. I won't. Now, if they want to change their tune and come back and think about it and go, oh, yeah, I was really rude. Oh, yeah. Well, I was wrong about that. You know, if they want to, you know, come forward and say, you know, I didn't quite understand what was going on. I didn't realize that you were just a volunteer here trying to help me out. I, you know, I'm sorry I acted like a, an idiot. I, I said things I shouldn't have said, blah, blah. If they wanted to come back and, and sincerely apologize, well, then there's that the, the possibility of love reaching out and saying, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll, we'll then, start over. Okay. Then there's all those people, Anna, that aren't even interested in being American. They're the ones that are here that are the Tories. They are the ones that are here that are in those other groups. They oh, sure. want their cake and they want to eat it too. And they think that you owe that to them, Anna, because you brought it to their attention, what's happened. And now because they were born on America, even though they have no allegiance to America, that they deserve this. But what they don't have any allegiance towards America, but they were born on America, Anna. What about them? Screw them. I mean, when we say to them, you wrote an article. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, you know. I'm no, just, listen, you wrote an article. I want to bring the truth out because I can't even take it. You know me, Anna. I want the truth. Okay. And everybody, and I walk on the truth and I have to stand by the truth, which means the truth applies to me too, which is the reason why when you correct me, I be quiet. 
Okay. When you correct me, I be quiet because you're like, no, you didn't get it. Then I'm like, oh, okay. And then I want to hear what you have to say because obviously I didn't get it. But there's a bunch of people out there who, when you tell them they didn't get it, they now want to argue with you and tell you how they did get it and how we don't get that they don't get or whatever. You know, this turns into this. No, 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 there's no, no, they're not getting it. They're obviously not getting it because they think that because we chartered this bank, then the bank owes them service. The bank doesn't owe them service. This is the thing. Okay. Just because we chartered it doesn't mean that the bank owes you individually, personally service. Now you can walk through our door in a friendly manner and you can enjoy the services like everybody else. There's no prejudice against you based on your race, creed, color, nothing. You know, Democrats are as welcome as Republicans. Okay. We don't care about that. But if you're going to come into our bank and you're going to be rude, you're going to make false accusations. You're going to uh, insult the people that are trying to help you. Uh, you're going to call people names. Uh, you know, any of that kind of behavior, you're going to be out the door. I'm sorry. Anybody who wants to badmouth America while getting American uh, assistance, sorry. See so, that? Anna, this is very different from the corporatocracy because the corporatocracy has trained everybody into believing the customer is always right. I mean, well, I'm sure you've seen all the promotions about how the customer is always right. No, no. You've also seen the little signs that say no shirt, no shoes, no service. Well, you know, we, the, the bank has a right to not serve anybody that's not being polite and reasonable. They can shut their door on anybody. They don't have to just give accounts out to everybody because, you know, oh, I'm an American and I'm showing up here and I'm being a complete nutter. You know what? And this no. mindset is the same as what is in the assembly. When you call the coordinator a tyrant, a dictator, a rat, and you're the rat watcher that's there to make sure that he's whatever, then you get somebody with their panties in a wad. Then they, they don't course correct. Then they're ready to condemn you for the bank. That was on the coordinator call. Then they're ready to condemn the coordinator because he's just following instructions and following the outline. Then they start with this name, and then the marshal says, you can't behave like this. And I give a warning. Then all hell breaks up because nobody says the marshal can warn you about your actions and your attitude and name calling. Nobody has to put up with name calling. Nobody has to put up with, with anything less than civility and decorum. And the bank doesn't have to put up with that either. Now, if you come back, you make, you know, you make a fool of yourself and you're, you're, you've harmed yourself by your own actions and the own, you know, the, the stuff spewing out of your mind and your mouth, just like Jesus said, it's not what goes into a man that makes him filthy. It's what comes out. The mirror. Okay. So the you mirror. Can, yeah. Yeah, you you go to the bank and you call you call the people their names and 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 you stomp around and and you want to be the big cheese and oh I'm so important you know you make a complete and utter ass of yourself and then you expect that you're not going to have any consequences for that well then they they say well we don't want to deal with this guy he's just a complete whack job he's rude and crude and, and calls us names so why should we serve him we're volunteers he didn't pay us anything to do this well we just won't open up his account he can sit there and stew and make his own bank mm -hmm. and you made a fool of yourself on video camera in the bank they in the bank on camera on the record. Also, um, they don't want cameras or anything on the record, even in the bank, which is hilarious. Further, you wrote an article 3374. For all the friends out there, y'all can look up article 3374. This article is where you're identifying uh, people who might be demonstrating signs of district infiltration, Anna. 
you wrote an article and you worked with people who, who were the coordinators who were bringing you some information. Then you added some items that said, yes, these are the things that look like that. And when you bring this information out to the people, then they don't, they're not wrecking. So the brainwashing and the mind control, Anna, is so powerful because people aren't able to comprehend anything. They're so busy trying to explain and defend all the time. Explain and defend and explain and defend rather than humble themselves and ask for the forgiveness that you're talking about. That requires them to humble themselves. They have to look inward. Well, what we want them to do, if they want to, they, I, we want them to get their attitude adjusted and realize that everybody at the bank is a volunteer who's there trying to help them. And they don't deserve any guff at all. I mean, there, there's just a few people that are trying to do this for millions of people. And, you know, you're, you're not going to have that kind of instantaneous service. No. And, you know, you're, it's, it's just going to be a, a, a development, an organic growth of the bank so that it can keep pace with the growth. And it's always going to be lagging a little bit behind. So you're always going to have to wait in line and, and you're just going to have to be civil and wait your turn. And that's all there is to it. <laughs> but if you've gone and made a fool of yourself and, and called people names and, and been a complete and utter idiot, then, you know, have the courage to come back and say, I'm sorry. Of course, correct. <laughs> Right. I'm sorry. I, I said these things and I, I was stressed out and, and I didn't understand how this was supposed to work. And, you know, I made some bad assumptions. I'm sorry. Um, I'm I'm hoping that you'll just overlook that and open up my account. And same people, for all the people. Same for the people on the assemblies. Like, you know, there's so many coordinators out there who are doing the best that they can and they're being attacked by their own assemblies. Um, this isn't just in one place. This is everywhere because there's even people out there who are in there in the assembly. If you have somebody on the assembly, Anna, and they're trying to teach and promote UCC and everything else because they're like, you can't put all your all your eggs in Anna's basket. Um, Excuse me. This blueprint requires us to have all our eggs in Anna's basket. Otherwise, the blueprint really doesn't work. And it's not like Anna just made this stuff up. This is Roman civil law. And there's so many other things involved in it, Anna. Can you please speak to that? Well, <sighs> where to even begin? Okay. Men and women, living people, own all the physical assets. Persons cannot own physical assets, okay? They have impersonated us so that we, on the record, look like we are humans, not men and women, humans, male and female. Or we're corporate for franchises, we're it's, we have no sex, we're just things, right? Okay, so this is part of the caste system. Men and women own the assets and the credit that is derived from the assets. Persons, humans, can male and female, can manage the assets. And then the slaves can be appointed to do various things, but they're, they're basically out of the running. They don't have any interest in it. So what we're trying to do here is establish that we are Men and women, first and foremost, we're living people, we're not persons. When we do that, we take over that, that penultimate position so that we are back in control of our world. We're not being custodialized by our, our public servants who are trying to make us into incompetence, okay? When we stand up and we say, hey, look, I'm, I'm a man, I'm a woman, I'm alive, I'm here and now, I'm competent to take care of my own business, thank you very much. I will make my own mistakes and I will bear responsibility for them, okay? When we do that, then we are in charge. Anything less than that, and we're just playing their game. We're acting as custodians too, 
or we're acting as persons, as public servants. We're pretending that we're indentured or we're slaves. And why pretend? At the end of the day, there's only men and women. This whole idea that we're persons or rendered persons or impersonated by the acts of others is just BS. I'm sorry. When you look around you, do you see anything uh, that has a completely different outlook and, and uh, appearance that has a, a sign you know, on its forehead that says it's a person? No. There's only men and women, some of whom act as persons and some of whom don't. Okay, so it is important to establish your, um, your, your birthright political status as a man or a woman because that puts you in control of your life and of your assets. Otherwise, you're a dependent upon these quote-unquote public servants, the military and the elected officials, right? These are male and, fail, male and female humans. They're not functioning in their true native capacity because they are what? They're indentured servants. They serve a tour of duty. They serve a term in office, right? They've taken over, even though they're indentured servants, and they're, they're managing all of your assets and making themselves rich in the process, and they're denigrating you. They're, they're leaving you behind in the dust while you are supposed to be their employer and you're supposed to be directing their activities on your behalf. Well, we haven't been directing their activities on our behalf because our government hasn't been in session and hasn't been assembled in decades. So what we're doing here is we're putting our government back together, restoring it and telling our public servants what we want done. And we're doing it from our proper capacity as men and women. So that's why you want to, you know, upgrade, update, um, restore your birthright political status is so that you are in a position of control of your own life. Otherwise, if you are a human or a um, person, then in the federal system, you're just an indentured servant or a slave. And who wants to be an indentured servant or a slave? All right, you have the free choice, make it and be proud of it and stand up for it and have a little bit of guts and courage, you know. Guts the and people, courage. You know, the people who have followed my, my instruction and who really learned it, they don't have any problems. They don't have to hide under a rock. They don't have to be afraid of putting their name in a newspaper. No. Okay. It's the people that didn't follow my instruction who landed in jail, like the Colorado nine. They never corrected their political status. And so they remained firmly under the statutory law and the statutory law condemned them. You can't pretend to follow what you're, you can't just presume and, and, they, they just wanted to do what you said and test the system, but they didn't actually correct their own status, which that doesn't work, friends. That doesn't work. Anyway, right. Anna, do you want to take some questions now? Are you ready? We'll just do a few questions here. Yeah, I'm sure. Oh, sorry, Cynthia. Go ahead. Let me start. What if, what if an attorney is not a bar attorney? How do we disable them? Like through the far. Oh. You just ask them if, well, okay, FARA applies to federal judges and federal attorneys, but now here's the problem. When they start working for the state of state franchises, they don't want to register under FARA, but they still have to because they're working for a franchise of the parent corporation, which is federal. Okay, so they're, they're basically evading the federal law by pretending that their state of state is separate from the federal parent corporation, which it's not. So they should all be lined up and they should all be signed. All the state of state attorneys should be uh, signing up and registering under FARA. And if they're not, they're in violation of the law. Okay, so there's that. 
Uh, if someone is not a bar attorney, then their only other option is to be a counselor of law. If they're a counselor of law, then they're working in our system, not theirs. Um, you might be counseling someone, but when you are a counselor of, counselor of law, what you do is you show up and you basically whisper in your client's ear and you tell them, okay, well, this is what they're doing and, and here are your choices. And then the person has to make the choice of what they're going to do with the situation presented. They're there basically as an interpreter. They're telling you how the current is operating and what your choices are given your situation and the issues involved. So that's why you're paying a counselor of law to be there is, is basically to counsel you as to how this is working and, and how this is viewed and how to, how to read the law that you're, that you're being addressed under. Uh, so if you want to fire a counselor of law, all you do is not pay them. Uh, second. <laughs> if you want to, if you want to fire a, a court appointed uh, attorney or a uh, public defender or somebody like that, you just say, well, are you going to be 100% uh, commercially and personally, personally liable? So that uh, no harm guaranteeing no harm comes to me as a result of your representation and you know just watch them run. <laughs> they will they will not take the job. It doesn't matter what the court says or anything. You just ask them that question and they will be gone because no, they're not going to guarantee any results for you in your favor. They're not going to guarantee that you won't be harmed by their representation of you. Uh, so if you want to get rid of them, that's how you do it. Here's one more that's been left over. It says, how does one fill in the gaps on the land title chain uh, between the public sale of records and land grant or patent? There's no, there's no gap. It went from a land grant and a land patent to a land title system. That's all that happened. So that just like there's no gap actually between the title transfers there's no gap between the grant and the title. Okay. Indigo wants to know, is it realistic to make Canada part of the, of America? Then we are able to be connected to Alaska. Oh, interesting. Well, in a sense, in, in terms of its sea jurisdiction, Canada is already attached to us. In fact, they've been attached to us for a long time and they're just considered a subsidiary. Uh, but that's from the, you know, the United States Inc. standpoint. The mm. thing that isn't joined is the land jurisdiction. And the land jurisdiction belongs to the people of Canada, which it should. So, you know, it was kind of an odd thing that, that uh, Canada and, um, you know, the United States was separated in the first place. It was just a happenstance. Uh, that the Hudson Bay Company sold out to the, the Canadian um, promoters instead of the U.S. promoters is what yeah. it amounts to. Okay, Indigo has like 10 questions in here because she was like super excited to get in. And so how do we get rid of daylight savings time? I think we just can do that ourselves, right? Once we take our four pillars up and manage our state, we can manage our own time, I think. What do you think? Well, yeah, the whole concept of time is, was created so that they could sell labor. That's why time even exists in our cognizance. Right. Um, and as far as daylight savings time, that's been a uh, something to argue about ever since Ben Franklin thought of it. Um, <laughs> I, I, it's, it's one of those small irritations in life that really doesn't merit a whole lot of effort, in my opinion. We got so much more to do right now than right. to focus on that. That you yeah. know, come on, we got to get our banks straightened out. We got to get our government straightened out. We got to get our money straightened out. Um, yes. We got enough to do for the next thirty years. And then we'll take care of this in, 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 as a side effect of that as well, which is the air army air traffic. We can, we'll get rid, we can manage all of that. And then also we can manage this. We can manage everything once we get our four pillars up and we take back our power. Yeah. Well, you have to remember that interstate and international in this country are completely uh, synonymous words because when you fly from one state to another, 
you are actually traveling from one country to another. Mm -hmm. Each state is autonomous. And you know, I was I brought this up yesterday on the um, on the webinar. Uh, the definition between an empire and a federation. A federation is a voluntary association of autonomous uh, states and people for their mutual benefit. Okay, that's what a federation is, as opposed to an empire, which is a forced ag aggregation of states and or territories, okay, um, under a supreme ruler or oligarchy. So what we have is a federation of independent autonomous states that are in effect their own countries and that's why when we have a airport in one state and you fly to an airport in another state it's all international hmm. okay so what's out there um like we said last time you'll be the first to know here because we're going to let everybody know when the banking is fully accessible for you to be able to do your transfers. And Anna, um, since last week, you know, what we've learned, because in the comments over the week, there's everybody in the, like all, there's so many um, like PayPal and Venmo and all these things that accept QR codes. So what I'm thinking, and I want, I was wondering for, you know, I wanted to hear what you had to say about this is um, all of these, uh, I'm going to call them middlemen merchants, you know, like PayPal and what have you, if they're already um, allowing us to operate with this QRC code, then wouldn't it make sense that individual businesses that currently might use PayPal, like, like I sometimes do, and I, I hate them. I don't want to do business with them. But if if I'm dealing with them right now and and I didn't know about the Global Family Bank and I found out about it because I know, oh, PayPal is now doing this thing with Global Family Bank, then I might as a vendor be like, ooh, how do I get a direct line? So I thought that once once the QR code is accessible, to the Americans that have already corrected their status, then I think it's going to be a natural thing that all these other individual uh, vendors are going to be like, whoa, we want to know what that is. And they will naturally fall away from all these other folks if they have any sense, because why wouldn't they go directly to Global Family Group with no fees and no garbage and instead of doing that, you know, and it would be easier to bring them there at that point as well. What are your thoughts? Well, it is a better deal. And it's better on it's better for vendors and it's better for the people who buy. You know, think about it. You have a choice, a free choice in whether you want to be compensated in a gold backed currency or you want to be uh, compensated with a Federal Reserve note. You have a free choice and it costs you nothing. You know, you as a vendor get to choose what, how you want to be paid and in what form you want to be paid. And you have a full roster of choices with global because, you know, it either comes out of the F, uh, AFD glo global gold account or it comes out of the uh, USD, which translates into FRN, right? So it, it doesn't really matter from the vendor side, it's perfect because you have no fees. It's instant payment. There's no delays. Um, and you get to choose how you want to be compensated, whether you want asset-backed currency or you want fiat currency. It's just your choice. So, um, you know, from a vendor standpoint, it's a no-brainer. From a no Oh, sorry. Well, from a buyer standpoint, it's, it's a great convenience, too, because... You know, again, you're not dealing with a credit card company. You're not having to deal with a 4% uh, fee for using a credit card. You're not having to deal with having a separate credit card company snooping into every purchase you make and keeping records and selling this information on to other corporations that then, you know, track your buying and, and you know, all the rest of this. You've got a, a completely private system. Uh, you know, if you want to, if, if you want to go buy organic food, 
uh, it's it's under the radar. Nobody knows. Nobody cares if you're buying organic food. You know, nobody's tracking what kind of toothpaste you like. You know, we're we're not doing any kind of commercial analysis of your buying patterns uh, and preferences. Yes. We're not selling that information on to anybody else. And so from a buyer's standpoint, just having both the facility to deal in either asset-backed or fiat, and also having the instant um, payment so that there's there's no foo foo of extra fees or services or anything, and also having the privacy so that, you know, nobody's tracking what you're buying. Right. You know, I think that that is... Um, you know, more than enough reason for, for people to participate as buyers. So both buyers and sellers have reasons why they should love the the new system that is being offered by Global. I think that they do. I think that there's people that are ready to use it. I think that the uh, only thing that's holding anybody back is the uh, accessibility for them to be able to pay the bills to the people who aren't going to, they, they can't directly transfer to right now. Um, so Charlie over here says, uh, hello, digital assets, blockchain consultant question. How is the convergence of the credits that's backed by gold exchanged for AFD? Where on the site can we find the exchange rates? Well, I'm not aware of credits that are backed by gold. So, you know, you've got me there. Um, that's a, a question that would have to be answered directly by the bankers. Uh, I do know that all of the different exchange rates are updated almost on the second and it's all computerized so that if you're exchanging gold for gold, um, you know, that, that should be a no brainer for them. They should just be able to do that instantaneously in the moment of, of whatever the exchange rate is at that time. And, you know, you'd have to call up global and, and just ask them, you know, how do we do this? Oh, okay. Ellen wants to, okay, so Ellen wants to know are there some consequences for taking money from services? I think that there is going to be a period of time, Anna, where we're operating in a transition, in a transition, because they're right. saying, you know, like you can't just go, we can't just make a quantum leap, Anna, right? Well, we can. At some points, we're going to need to, but Look at this. Take, in, take example. They've weaponized the medical profession. This, this pandemic proved that they weaponized the medical profession. And this isn't the first time they've done that. Um, they have weaponized doctors and nurses, and there's a reason. Um, they are uniformed officers under Title uh, 31. And um, you'll see uh, evidence of that in other titles, too but they have um, turned them into uniformed officers and that's how they conscript them also. That's how they, they just, you know, come through when there's a war and they take guys like uh, Hawkeye Pierce and, and say, Oh, well, you're not practicing medicine and Crabtree anymore. You're going to go to Korea. Uh, they're when they license these doctors, doctors don't realize this by the way, but when they license these doctors, then they conscript them and they're actually part of a civilian, and this is another oxymoron, a, a civilian military force. So what they did is they, they weaponized the doctors. They basically came in and, and gave them a carrot and a stick during the pandemic. They said, you know, uh, you either do this and, and you uh, perform under, under this and you do these vaccinations, or we'll pull your license. And as far as the doctors are concerned, they're ignorant. They think that if they pull their license, it's the end of the world and they can't practice medicine. Well, actually, uh, yes, they can practice medicine as private physicians and they don't have to lick boots to do it. Um, and every physician in America should be looking at, you know, what percentage of my practice is actually federal workers because that's what the license is for. You know, that they license you to be able to provide services to federal employees. And if your practice doesn't involve a lot of federal employees, you have no reason to be licensed. 
And then the other thing is, um, even if you do have uh, federal employees who are just walking in off the street, you can do a new patient form question and ask if they're federal employees. And you can have a disclaimer and tell them just flat out, look, um, I'm not licensed by your employer to uh, provide you with services. But if you want to receive the services of this office, then you just sign this little check mark here and you can waive any, um, any concern about that. Okay, so you can continue as a private physician. And then they say, oh, but I won't be able to prescribe drugs. Well, then you should all join together and ask the federal government, I, that is the corporation, where they have any regulatory control over any kind of drug. And when you ask that question, it turns out that they don't have any regulatory control over any drug or your ability to prescribe it. What they have is a, um, a licensing practice over pharmacists the same way they do over doctors. And they tell the pharmacists, well, if, if you allow people to um, have access to these drugs, then we're gonna take your license. Well, at which point the pharmacists have the right to say, well, you don't have any right to tell me what to do and you don't have any, any regulatory authority over drugs. And what we should do is do a gigantic uh, class action suit against the corporations and say, look, where's your regulatory authority over drugs? Show us your regulatory authority over the general public and over any of these general practitioners over drugs. And they don't have it. They're just assuming a power again that they were never granted. And so, um, you know, all these people have been bamboozled by the, the American Medical Association and, and by the other uh, groups that set them up as the arbiters of destiny. And they're all illegal as hell, too. The yeah. Bar Association, the a AMA, all this crap is just imported stuff from Europe that doesn't belong here and never should have been here. And mm -hmm. it was brought here by our federal employees who were part of that system and they brought the caste system too. Mm -hmm. Okay, this guy's got a bunch of questions here, Charlie. Okay, with you all wanting the AFD to act as a stable coin pegged to gold and the credits, why the physical dollar fiat, if you will? We don't have a physical fiat dollar because the dollar has gold in it. But yeah, right. go ahead, the AFD is gold backed and it, you know, it's not, it's, it's not, not yeah. a yeah, dollar at all. Um, but, you know, why the, why to continue ha having the fiat? Well, it's going to take a transition away from the fiat. Not everybody's going to have instantaneous access to, you know, the gold asset backed money. Right. And, you yeah. know, the, the people have to live in the meantime. So, you know, the big concern here is how do we, transition this without everybody starving to death in the meantime. Right. Bear in mind that we only have about a three week window of uh, keeping people alive. If the, if the financial system goes down, uh, we have about three weeks and you can, you can just count it. Yes. That's, so, what, that's what people don't comprehend. They don't realize that there is only one week's worth of food in a grocery store. There's and and there one grocery store like in our market is servicing ten thousand households. That's just the grocery store. That doesn't count everything else like the gas stations and all the things that you use money for. Right, Charlie. Saying, yeah. Well, look, it's the same way with any gold-backed currency. It's the same way with you know, uh, Remimbi. Now that they're gold-backed, uh, anytime that you have a gold backed currency, the gold exchange rate establishes the rate with all the other currencies. So, you know, it's we're no different than trading in any other silver or gold currency. What is the blockchain oh. company that is handling the smart contracts of the AFD? We, don't do, smart, we don't do smart contracts. Uh, what we do is we do our own system first to last. And it's a cutting edge system. It's actually, a, a, it's better than Basel IV, but it's it's a very uh, advanced, very good, and very secure uh, blockchain system. And we have our own satellites, our own servers, everything. 
Shirley James wants to know, hello, Anna, can I request all of my SSI and in one payment instead of multiple payments when I am retired? Well, I don't know why you're getting SSI, but SSI is not the same as Social Security per se. SSI is a separate special kind of emergency program mm -hmm. uh, that kicks in. Uh, for example, if you are injured or develop a debilitating uh, medical condition before your retirement age, okay? Um, so uh, it, it's it's not the same thing as, as, as Social Security. So uh, no, you, you could not uh, get an SSI um, one payment. Some people are opting out of the Social Security system entirely um, and they are demanding a one one time payment, which is discounted heavily in, in favor of the Social Security Administration. But um, SSI is not the same as Social Security main program. Jennifer on Oregon wants to know the county says I owe $26,000 in back taxes and they sell it for more than that. Are they supposed to pay me the amount over $26,000? Yes, they are. And if they don't, it's an illegal taking. And there was just a recent um, uh, Supreme Court case about that. So um, you can look up illegal taking. There's a, uh, there's a codicil in, in the Constitution that um, prevents illegal taking. But actually, you know, the whole proceedings should be regarded as an illegal taking because, as I pointed out, all of this is predicated on debts owed in Federal Reserve notes, and Federal Reserve notes are not money. So um, they're, they're basically your own credit. So, you know, I gave a whole laundry list of, of court citations um, that once you are back on the land and soil, you can use uh, and just say, I don't owe you anything. You know, it, obviously, if it doesn't count as money and, and people can't even be prosecuted for stealing it, then it can't be used as debt either. Living on Arkansas says, should ASNs delay getting our baby needed children their credential card or passport for ID? They can't get a credential card till they're 21, but the passport for ID. I don't think so. There's really no reason. Um, if you think that you might be traveling out of country, it's good to get your whole family um, papered up in time. Uh, there, there's been a lot of concern that having a passport is going to uh, cripple your standing. But no, once you have your standing, you have general jurisdiction. You've regained control of your life and you've gained control over your persons. So, you know, it really doesn't matter. Donna is saying, explain the steps for your article of fraudulent tax sales claiming. We're not going to go through a whole step-by-step -step thing here on the show because you wrote like 10 different articles about this. Also, there's a YouTube recording um, about that as well. And there's a class on the land patent. If you go into, um, go, go to the show that me and Michelle do on Mondays in California actually has an entire land patent class on their thing. So Donna, go, go to our show that we did yesterday and look at the show notes. And in the show notes, there um, is uh, the California uh, link tree. And in that there is a class for the land patents that Anna teaches. Rick is saying, Anna, how soon will we be electing our president? <laughs> Well, you know what? Everybody wants to, to move on and nobody wants to do the, the foundation work. It's like everybody wants to put the roof on the house before the, the foundation is laid. You have to get your states up and running first. Once you get your states up and running, then you can elect your congressional delegation and you can start the whole thing of, of presidential elections and, you know, have, have everything up and running. But you have to get your states settled out first. You have to have your state assembly running. You have to have your courts. You have to have your militia. You have to have your international business uh, assembly, and you have to have your general assembly 
uh, all you know completely recorded and set up. Joseph wants to know if a covenant that is attached to my deed has failed to disclose Pharaoh registration and failed to provide remedy and relief from the covenant, is it null and void ab initio? Ab initio. Um, initio. From the beginning. Um, I'm not, I, I would have to look at the actual paperwork i you know i'd have to look at the covenant i'd have to see what you were actually talking about uh in terms of failure to disclose a pharaoh registration um I, I don't know what the remedy is that was guaranteed that you didn't get i mean there's that's it's that's an entire case examination that would have to be required jennifer in oregon says i gave public notice of paramount claim and FSIA on what are 3 14 2018. Am I protected from property taxes as of that date? No, the way you protect yourself from property taxes is by claiming your land all the way back, do the chain of title, do the patent claim, and then rename your, your land and record that with the Department of Natural Resources, their land recording office. You, you just, you know. I've gone over this. When when they are doing these property taxes, what they're actually taxing is the road easement in front of your place that they have given an assigned name and number. Okay, so when they're looking at a, a piece of property, they come by and they they name the road easement, you know, 1511 Morningside Drive. Okay. They assign a number and they assign a street name to it. And um, that's how they keep track of the road easement interest that the public has in the road easement. They assign an address to that road easement. And then when they sell out their interest in that copyrighted road easement, they take your property with it by assumption. And mm -hmm. so have to do to protect yourself from that is you have to do your chain of title do your land patent or land grant claim okay and then you just rename your title you, re you rename the property if they called it 1511 road you know morningside drive then you name your driveway um 1511 parkside you know whatever you want to name your property you name it and you, you put, you know, you, you attach your uh, property description that you've developed, uh, your description of your property and that name with the Department of Natural Resources and separate your private property from their public property. So when they sell their interest in the road easement, it's like, Gee, I'm so glad somebody bought the interest in that road easement. I hope they make a lot of money off of it. And I also hope that they take care of it and make sure that it's mowed. <laughs> Put it back on them. They're, they're, they've been attaching American property and demanding property taxes on this basis since the 1930s. And it's all bogus. The public interest does not extend to your private property as long as you demark your private property from the public interest. And what's the public interest? It's just the road easement. Okay, this is the last question, Anna. Lois wants to know, are we able to select beneficiaries on our prosperity account where and how? Oh, that's a good question. I've never encountered it before. Um, I don't know the answer. I don't see why not. I mean, it would be the same as, as having, you know, a bank account and having X dollars in it and, and being able to pass that on to your grandson or, you know, whoever else you chose. Uh, so it, it should just transfer and then it would transfer into their name or their account. Should, um, you had suggested, um, you know, putting our last will in our Bible. So... Well, I, well, yeah, these guys are already running. If you walk in and you say, 
where's the basis of authority for a probate court in America? They're going to go, oh, you know, they're going to kind of dry up and blow away. We've had probate courts that just shut down overnight and all the people that were involved in them disappear. Mm-hmm. It's a stranger. You ask that question and they vanish. The, the, the doors of the courthouse get locked. And all the, the, you know, overnight they blow town. It's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. So, you know, they're, they're not going to be um, contesting your right to your property, not with any probate courts anymore. Um, the, the problem is, is that we have a different law. We live under a completely different law. We live under American common law. And they live under statutory law. And so when they die, their estates come under statutory law. When we die, our estates come under common law. Well, you did it, Anna. We finished. We did it. And we're way past our time. So we are going to see all of you friends out there in YouTube land next Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern and 9 a.m. Alaskan Standard Time. Thank you. We love you.